There are plenty of action movies about mountain climbing filled with adventure, challenges, and triumph. But there's one real-life mountain climbing story that's almost as much a comedy as it is an adventure. It's the story of the first team that ever made it to the peaks of Denali, the tallest mountain in North America. They had almost no climbing experience, and the only reason they did it was to settle a bet. And then when they came down, nobody believed that they did it. This story has all the makings of an action comedy blockbuster. So let's lace up our boots and get into it. Now, you might have learned that Mount McKinley is the tallest mountain in North America. Me too. But it's the same mountain. Before it was called Mount McKinley, the local indigenous people had already named it Denali, an Anthabascan word that means the high one. A gold prospector who was a fan of then presidential candidate William McKinley started calling it Mount McKinley to troll supporters of McKinley's opponent, and the name stuck. In 2015, the United States formally recognized Denali as the mountain's official name, so I'm going to call it Denali. But at the time of our story, the United States had no say in what the mountain was called anyway, because this story begins 50 years before Alaska became a state. In 1906, an explorer named Frederick Cook claimed that he was the first person to summit Denali. This photo supposedly showed him at the top of the mountain. But in fact, he did not make it to the top. The photo was actually taken on a ridge more than 19 miles away. This ridge is now known as Fake Peak. A couple years later, Cook claims that he was the first person to reach the North Pole. But then in 1909, Robert Peary reached the North Pole in this amazing outfit. And he publicly challenged Cook's claim to have gotten there first. Now suddenly, all of Cook's claims were being re-examined. Meanwhile, in Fairbanks, Alaska, a coal miner with no climbing experience was sitting in a bar. He heard about Cook's claim of summiting Denali, and he was skeptical. His name was Thomas Lloyd. He had been working around Denali for years, and he knew the region well. He boasted that, heck, for someone like him, it would be easier to just climb the mountain than pretend to have climbed it. The bartender, Bill McPhee, says, Tom, you are too old and too fat to climb to the top of Denali. Tom says, I'll bet you two cents I can climb to the top. Bill says, you're on. Furthermore, I'll give you $500 to help. Two other locals match Bill's contribution, each adding $500 of their own. Tom takes the $1,500 and uses that to buy supplies. He already owned his own dogs and sleds and figured that would cover everything else he needed. He rounds up three friends to go with him. Two of his fellow miners, Charles McGonagall and Pete Anderson, and his business partner, Billy Taylor. Their adventure was dubbed the Sourdough Expedition, Sourdough being a nickname for Alaskan prospectors. And so, in February 1910, those four miners with no mountaineering experience set out to climb Denali. Denali actually has two peaks. The sourdoughs were heading to the North Peak, 19,470 feet above sea level, a bit lower than the South Peak's 20,310 feet. They hauled a 14-foot-tall flagpole that they intended to plant at the top of the mountain. Over several weeks, they made their way up setting up camps along the way. On April 1st, they made an initial attempt to go 8,000 feet from their last camp to the top of the mountain but weather forced them back down. A couple days later on April 3rd, two members of the expedition tried again. Billy Taylor and Pete Anderson climbed 8,000 feet in one day, finally reaching the top. They stayed long enough to plant their flag and head back down. Once off the mountain, Taylor, Anderson, and McGonagall stayed in a town called Kantishna, while Thomas Lloyd went back to Fairbanks to boast about the team's success. Without the rest of the team there, Thomas Lloyd was the star of the show, giving interviews to the local newspaper, the Fairbanks News Miner. From there, the news spread quickly around the world. The tallest mountain in North America had finally been conquered. It wasn't long before people became suspicious of Lloyd's story. Maybe he was a liar, just like Frederick Cook. Just a week after the climb, the New York Times published statements by naturalist Charles Sheldon, 
a man who later became known as the father of Denali National Park. He knew three of the four men who climbed the mountain, and he was skeptical, saying, none of them knows anything about technical mountain climbing. They have never seen an alpine rope or an ice axe and are not familiar with technical mountaineering equipment. The difficulties of an ascent are so great that a great deal of public skepticism, particularly among those who are familiar with the hardships of mountain climbing, is sure to exist. And you know what? I don't blame him for being skeptical. Some of these guys were middle-aged and overweight, they had no real climbing experience, and they made claims of feats even experienced hikers wouldn't attempt. For example, you remember how they climbed the last 8,000 feet in one day? Even modern Denali climbers save the last three to 4,000 feet for the last day, and they take 10 to 15 hours to do it. Two months later, the New York Times published a three-page account of the expedition in Tom Lloyd's own words, including photos, notes from his journal, and transcribed recollections. But instead of just using the opportunity to defend his team's accomplishment, Lloyd embellished his story. He said that he went to the top of the mountain himself, and that they didn't just go to the North Peak, but the South Peak too. In the article, he says incorrectly that the two peaks are of equal height. But if he believed that to be true, then just reaching the North Peak should have been enough to say he reached the top of Denali. So why did he lie? It put the rest of his team in a terrible position of either having to lie also, or admit that at least some aspects of their story should be called into question. It was such a mess that people joked that the mountain shouldn't be called McKinley or Denali, but Mount Denial, which is actually a pretty good name for the movie version of this story. Then in 1913, another expedition went up Denali. Hudson Stuck and Harry Karstens led a four-man team all the way up to the south summit of Denali, becoming the first people to truly reach the top of the mountain. And when they came back, they brought news. All four members of the team reported that they saw the Sourdough Expedition's 14-foot flagpole on the North Summit. Finally, the story was independently verified and the Sourdoughs could get the recognition they deserve. But to this day, still not everyone believes it. People have come up with reasons why Stuck and Karsten might have lied for the Sourdoughs, and none of their photos show them anywhere near the top of the mountain. And since all this happened 100 years ago, you might think that's where things still stand. But late last year, new evidence was discovered that sheds more light on the story. My name's Matthew Sturm. I'm a professor of geophysics, but I also have a very strong interest in Arctic history and Arctic exploration. Dr. Sturm is working on a book about climbing in the Yukon in Alaska. So he went to the University of Alaska archives to do some research. When you go to an archives, you're basically using finding aids and they're little snippets that say something that'll give you some idea of what's in a box. And uh, there's a little snippet of 1911 Denali climb, but it's like, well, there's no climb in 1911. It's like, wow, that's odd. I wonder what's in that box. Kind of opened it up with some anticipation. And the very first thing I saw was a sepia tone photo, of two faces that I swore I knew old time climbers, but something about their faces just tickled something in my head because I recognize these two. Dr. Sturm took the photo and compared it to other known photos of early ascents of Denali, including the Sourdough Expedition. Sure enough, it was Pete Anderson and Charlie McGonigal. So I knew then I'd stumbled on photos, essentially the lost photos from that expedition. For historians, that's about as exciting as it gets. You're like, you found the treasure trove that you didn't even know existed. Besides the portrait, there were several landscapes among the photographs. Dr. Sturm used an online tool called Peak Finder to pinpoint where on Denali each one was taken. And slowly with time, was able to place all of the photos. The highest photo is just under 16,000 feet. Skeptics thought they never got above 11,000 feet. So we added about 5,000 feet to what they climbed. There's always going to be people thinking other things happen, but the new photos move us probably, I think, 90% of the way to validating that they did exactly what they said. Tom Lloyd's story was incredible enough as it was. He didn't need to lie about reaching both summits. His lie became the story, and it took away from what should have been the real lessons. His team of amateurs accomplished something that nobody else had done. It's a testament to what ordinary people can do with enough determination. 
But also, sometimes success doesn't have to be about achieving that ultimate goal. It can be about pushing your boundaries and achieving more than you thought possible. And if anyone ever does make a movie out of this story, I hope that's what they focus on as the heart of the film. In the meantime, thanks for watching, and I'll see you on Denali, which is totally a mountain I'm capable of climbing. Wait, hang on before you go one last thing. I decided to try an experiment with this video. I made a commentary track. It's not a commentary track you can listen to, but a commentary track that you can read in the captions. In order to find it, you have to go back to the beginning of the video and choose Klingon as your caption language. Why Klingon? Because I didn't want it to show up automatically for anyone based on the language of their region, so I had to choose a language that was unlikely that anyone has set as their default caption language, hence Klingon. So check it out, let me know what you think, and if you think I should do it again.